can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Great. Ooh. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I greet you all in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor and say you are welcome in the presence of the Lord. Say you are welcome in the presence of the Lord. First of all, I greet you in the name of the Lord. I'd like to thank God for this day and thank mommy and daddy for this day and allowing me to share the word of the Lord with you. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor and say, this is the day the Lord has made. <coughs> and I will rejoice and be glad in it. Can you tell three people, can you stand up and tell three people, this is the day the Lord has made. Hallelujah. Let us open our Bibles in the book of Genesis 37 from verse 5 to verse 11. Tell your neighbor and say, the will of God will prevail in me today. Genesis 37 from verse 5 to verse 11. Are you there yet? <coughs> Can I read? Genesis 37, 5 says, Now Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. He said to them, Please, to the details, to the details of his dream which I have dreamed, we brothers were binding sheaves of grain stalks in the field, and lo, my sheaf suddenly got up and stood upright and remained standing. And behold, your shift stood all around my shift and bowed down in respect. His brother said to him, are you actually going to rule over us? Are you really going to rule and govern us as your subjects? So they hated him even more for telling them about his dreams and for, this and for his arrogant words. But Joseph dreamt still another dream and told it to his brothers as well. He said, see here, I have again dreamed a dream, and lo, this time I saw 11 stars, and the sun and the moon bowed down in respect to me. He told it to his father as well as to his brothers, but his father rebuked him and said to him in disbelief, what is the meaning of this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come to bow down to the ground in respect before you? Joseph's brothers were envious and jealous of him, but his father kept the words of Joseph in mind, wondering about their meaning. Hallelujah. 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 Verse 9 says, But Joseph dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers as well. And he said, see here, I have again dreamed a dream. And lo, this time I saw 11 stars and the sun and the moon bow down in respect to me. Tell your neighbor and say, hold on. Tell your, another, your other neighbor and say, hold on. Here we are reading a story about a young name, man named Joseph. This young man was a dreamer. He dreamed dreams that were scary or unbelievable. This young man was fortunate enough or rather was lucky enough or blessed enough for God to show him what his future would look like. And as a young man, he thought to himself, let me share with my elders, my elder brothers, and I tell him, tell them what I have dreamed. 
maybe perhaps when he was explaining, he thought maybe his brother were actually going to give an explanation or help clarify for him what his dream meant. But unfortunately, the Bible says his brothers hated him even more. It means what his brothers felt for him before the dream was evil and bad. But after the dream, it became wickedness. Why? Because they now realized the star or the future or the destiny that God has given Joseph as a young man. Now, Joseph is like you and me as Christians. I believe their dreams, their hopes, their visions that we had when we first came to the Lord. Hallelujah. And some of us, God has shown us, or God has somehow indicated what your destiny looks like. Like Joseph, we had visions, we have dreams. And we go to certain people hoping for clarity and clarification of, look, I have seen something like this. What could this mean? And we didn't know that the beginning of our knowledge of where God is taking us is the beginning of trouble and persecution for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If Joseph had known that his dreams were going to make his brother, his brothers rather, to sell him one of the good days, I don't think Joseph was going to share his dreams with his brothers or tell his father what he had dreamed. But this young man is saying, look, I'm dreaming we are in the field and we are tying sheaves. As the, I believe as they were tying them, they were lying down. And the young man said, I saw my own standing up. And yours surrounded mine and bowed in respect. The blunder that the jo Joseph brothers had is they didn't have a foresight of seeing that Joseph is meant to be their savior at some point in life. But because Joseph was a young man full of courage and hope, yet he dreamt again. Meaning there were some things perhaps that could have happened between him and his brothers after the first dream that maybe could have discouraged him or that could have maybe affected him negatively so that maybe he does not believe in the dream he had. But the Bible says he dreamed again another dream. And this time, the sun and the moon and the stars were involved. It was not only his brothers. Even the universe was involved. Meaning in that destiny that God has given you, even the universe is involved. Even the universe is aware. Even the enemy is aware and involved. But what do you do as a child of God? Who you are in God, you are in Christ, you know where God is taking you. And yet there are other brothers in your midst or amongst you who hate you. You hold on. Now holding on is not, is not an easy thing to do because there are often sometimes that things come or circumstances come that suggest that holding on it might not be the possible best solution for the moment. Why? Because as you hold on, your grip is tested, your faith is tested, your trust is shaken. You ask yourself questions as I'm holding on. This thing that I'm holding on, will it still save me in the future? Will it still work? Will it still lead me where I'm supposed to go? But the Bible says, Joseph dreamed for the second time another dream. And this time, I believe God was assuring him, look, even if your brothers hate you, I, the Lord, know the plans I have for you. As I have shown you through the sieve, your brothers, they are sieve bowing for you. Even the moon and the stars and the sun will bow for you in respect. And I believe that thing made Joseph as a young man to hold on and say, there is something special about me. There is something unique about me. There is something that is different about me from my brothers. Remember, these brothers were 12 in number. Meaning there were 11 other people or there were 11 other obstacles in Joseph's life. But Joseph still held on to the dream that he saw. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Meaning as you are holding on, there are going to be challenges. There are going to be obstacles. There are going to be people around you who will want to make you to let go of what God has given you. There are other things that are going to happen to make you doubt and start questioning yourself about what God has promised you. Remember the Bible says a double-minded man cannot receive anything. The minute you start doubting, it means you have now let go. Because you can't doubt and hold on at the same time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This young man believed what God said. This young man held to the dream. Although his brothers plotted evil against him, he still said, I dreamed. And I saw. How many of us, when the enemy comes against you, you can, able, you can be able to stand and say, these are the promises of God concerning me. How many of us, when challenges rise, or 11 people rise in wickedness, you can still say, this is what God has promised me. And in my Christian life, I'm holding on to what he has said. Until I see it coming. Now, you can't hold on to what God said without having faith. It means you must, first of all, believe in the one who showed you. Second of all, you must believe in yourself. That there is something different in me, about me, that is supposed to happen in my life. Now, the problem is when we now start, when God has given us a promise, we now want to mix it with what other people think. And how other people perceive it and see it. We now want explanations of what do you think about this and what will become of you. Whereas he who has promised you, the Bible says, he is faithful to bring to completion the good work that he has started in you. You have to understand as a child of God, as a Christian, there are things that are unique about you. You are not supposed to be like other people. Christianity is not a standard form. It's not a train that is moving on metro rail. That you have to adjust yourself to the speed of it, of the train so that you can get in. You have to be aware at a certain time so that you can get in the train. No. Christianity is unique. It's different. That's why it's a personal thing between you and the Lord. Why? Because what God has sent, sent you with in this life is not what God has sent me with in this life. You have a purpose of your own, I have a purpose of my own. But the, the, the only common thing between me and you is that we need to hold on to the promise of the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Joseph knew the uniqueness in him. Why don't you know the uniqueness in you? Joseph knew that Joseph knew that out of the twelve, 12 children of Jacob, he is the only one who can dream of the future. He is the only one who can tell what will happen years to come. And he never wanted for a minute to be the same as his brothers. But the question is then, why do you want to be the same as the people around you, as a child of God? The Bible says you are like a hill set upon the a light set upon the hill which cannot be hidden. Which everybody can see from a distance. Then how come we are children of God that we are not set on the hill? We are the lambs that are hid under the table. Because we are not holding on to what God has promised you. All of us here, you were told at some point, one point or another, that sorry, this is what God is going to do for you. This is what is going to happen to you. This is what, this is what, this is what. But we are still here and most of us, the manifestation or the fulfillment of that promise has not come. Why? Because we had let go already. Yes, we are still in the flock. We are still coming to church. We are still worshiping. We are still praying. But in all honesty, we have now let go of the hand of the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Tell your neighbor and say, hold on. The Bible says in Genesis, as you are reading, as you are reading going down, that when he kept on dreaming, his brothers plotted against him. 
go home and read the whole of, of chapter 37 to, to until chapter 42. His brothers now plotted against him. And his brother thought, it wise that no, let's, let's kill this young man. Because why? This young man is now telling them what the future hold. And them as elders, as big brothers, they don't even know what the future hold. They don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. And here is this small boy telling us, I saw this. And then they are thinking, me with all my stature and all my age and all everything that I have eaten food before you could eat pap, I have to bow to you. But they failed to realize that there is a savior that God had brought in their midst who's going to save them in time of trouble. Their eyesight was shortened. They couldn't see far and beyond. Why? Because they were not in the belief that Joseph had. They were not holding on to God like Joseph was. Now, trust me, Joseph didn't have much reason to hold on to the dreams because he could have easily said, but Lord, you are showing me this, but I have 11 other brothers. You could have showed the elder one. You could have showed Bertuel. I mean, you, you could have shown another one. At least he will tell our father it will become better. But it is him, the last born, that God showed the future. And the young man held to his dream. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My question is, are you still holding on? Those promises that God has given you. We have now let go of God's hand so much that we now believe everything that happens around us. And everything that everybody suggests around us. It's no longer the Christianity of you and God. It's the Christianity of us and God. It's no longer a personal thing. It's a group thing. That we pray, I dream something, we pray about it and we get a clarification. And one suggestion, this is not exactly how it says, you don't really have to pay much attention to it. And you let go of the promises of God. And some of us have now let go of the destiny that God has given us. Why? Because we tried to fit in into what is around us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are you with me, somebody? Ask your neighbor and say, are you holding on? Are you holding on? From verse 18, his brothers, the Bible says, they plotted. And they say, let's kill him. And we throw him in the pit. And we take his clothes to our father. And we say, wild animals ate him. And this is all we could find. And one of the brothers said, no, don't shed the blood of your brother. Rather, let's put him in the ditch. And we leave. We will tell our father, we, tell, we take his clothes and kill a sheep and put it, the blood all over his clothes, and we tell our brother that the animals have eaten him. The Bible says he was thinking as a firstborn that, no, I will go behind their back and save my younger brother and deliver him to our father. Why? Because the father loved him so much. Joseph's another problem was the fact that he was his father's favorite son. How, how many times have you told somebody what God has shown you and the person say to you, when are we got a one? It's like this God hears you alone. It's like you hear God a lot more than all of us. And a little under, under the pressure of this life, you say, oh, okay. Okay, it, it, it means, you know, maybe I didn't hear well. Whereas that person who says that to you is a switching off the light that God has given you. Instead of you to hold on and say, this is the promise that God has given me. And I'm going to hold it until the end. You let go. Joseph was hated because, one, he was a dreamer. He could tell the future. Two, he was his father's favorite. And the Bible says, because they couldn't kill him, they now sold him. And now, persecution and misery 
for little Joseph began. The same persecution and misery that follows you when now people start realizing you are a child of God. And they now use Christianity or the name of God to mock you in your Christianity. Now the question is, whilst they are mocking you, using the name of the Lord, are you still holding on? Because the Bible says, when Joseph was sold into slavery, he was still holding on what? The promise, the dream. That I saw. I saw. My brother saved, bowing. I saw the stars, the moon, and the sun. Bowing in respect. Although when he got to Egypt, his life became a little bit better and he found himself in Potiphar's house. And he was taking care of everything. Joseph still didn't forget what God had promised him. How many of us, when God elevates us a little bit, we let go and forget the promises of God? And finally, we find ourselves in a state of we have arrived where God is taking us. I believe when, when God allowed Joseph to be a ruler over Potiphar's house, it was for training that when he finally governs Egypt, he will know exactly what he was doing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Some of us, God trusts us with small positions, small things. To show us, remember, I said the plans I have for you is to prosper you. But when we get there, when we now see the promises that is about to come to pass, we let go of the promise and the hand of God. And we find ourselves no longer working towards the goal that God has. You are now working towards the goal that you, ne you have for yourself. How many of us, when we first got saved, all you wanted was to be a Christian and love Christ and preach the word of God and die and go to heaven? That today, because we, we, had, we were following the scripture that says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. We were seeking wholeheartedly. We were looking for God wholeheartedly. We were devoted to God wholeheartedly. Seeking nothing but his kingdom. The second stanza of that verse says, and all these things shall follow. Now because we are seeking earnestly, they start following and we forget the goal is the kingdom. Because we are diligently seeking him, like Sam says. Then he starts to give us the desires of our hearts and we forget that it's about the kingdom that we are seeking. How many of us now we pray prayers that you want God to bless you so that you can show your family that God is alive? How many of us are now praying prayers, God bless me so that I can, I can prove to my enemies that you are alive? How many of us are praying prayers that, God, I want this promotion so that I can show them that you are alive? Bless me and give me this car, this house, so that they can see that I save a bigger God. Whereas the aim of God to give you that blessing, that house or, or that car, was for him to show them, not for you, for him to show them that he is God. The aim when God blesses you is not for you to go to them and say, you see what my God can do? The aim is for them to realize behind closed doors that his God is great. Not you saying it, realize behind closed doors. I was having this conversation with mommy one day. I said, mommy, there is nothing that beats honestly, honesty behind closed doors. Because even if you can deny it in my face, but when you are alone in your house at night, you can admit to yourself that my God is great. And at that point, there's nothing you can do about it. To my face, you can deny and say, yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever, whatever. But by yourself, in quietness, you can really say that, yeah, but that God is great. 
Hallelujah. And all of that can only happen when we keep holding on. We keep holding on to the promises of the Lord. We keep holding on to our salvation. We keep holding on to the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because it is all about the kingdom after all. And rather than every single thing that we acquire in this life. That's why the Bible says, what benefits a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Why? Because your soul is the most important one. He didn't die for you to live in pleasure and enjoyment. He died that you might have life and life in abundance. It's just that because he's a faithful God, he says, when you seek me with all your heart, I will give you, I, the Lord, will give you the desires of your heart. Why? Because those desires are not what you are seeking for. It is me that you are seeking for. In the kingdom, there's everything. And in the kingdom, you can get everything. But the secret of getting everything in the kingdom is through holding on to the Lord. You can't let go of what God, of God himself and you expect him to keep giving you what belongs to him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Bible says there were tests for little Joseph. But his first wife, his master's wife, wanted to sleep with him. The Bible said he ran for his life. Why? Because there is a promise. There is a dream I had. And I didn't have it once, I had it twice. David says, once the Lord has spoken twice, I had him. It was not once, it was twice. Therefore, I don't need conviction from other people. I am convinced within myself that he who has saved me is capable enough to take me to where he wants me to be. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the midst of everything happening, testing the faith of Joseph, Joseph kept on holding on to the dream. The Bible says he was even in prison, but he kept holding on to the dream. He was under bondage and surveillance, but he kept holding on to the dream. I know I saw. The stars, the moon, and the sun, they were bowing. I know I saw it. Until a good day came, we finally Pharaoh dreamed a dream that nobody could interpret in the whole of Egypt except Joseph. Now that's where the uniqueness of Joseph comes in and shows up. Now if Joseph had dreamed or cried to be the same or blended with his brothers, or when God showed him what he will be in the future, he killed it down and said, it cannot be me. When that day come, doom would have befall the entire world. Because when that day come, and the wise men, the Bible says, when they were called, they couldn't interpret what it meant. Seven fat cows, seven slim cows. They couldn't interpret that. And here's a young man who was sold from the pit. Whose father knows that the animals ate him and he died. And all he had was the cloth that his last son was wearing. That he made himself of many colors which had blood stains of animals. But Jacob didn't know that it was blood of animals. He thought his hope was gone. Gandhi, God was busy working behind the scene. See, the one thing about God is that when he picks you up, he's not only thinking about you, he's thinking about your entire generation. He's thinking about the entire country. He's thinking about the entire world. That's why you need to learn to hold on to the promises he gives you because it's not only about you, it's about the world and his name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
The Bible says when that day finally came, Joseph was called. And the same Joseph was recommended by his cellmate at some point that he also helped. You see what God does? When he places you some, somewhere, he knows exactly what he's doing with you. That's why he said in Isaiah that my hand is not too short not to save you. The problem is when God has placed you, you familiarize yourself with your surrounding. And that alone takes away the dream that God has given you. The promise that God has promised you. Many of us, we have been told, you will become this, you will become that. You will do this, you will do that. But most of us, we have now derailed ourselves from the promise of God and we are now in our own path that we think it's taking us where God wants us to go. Just because we had let go of the promises of God. We are no longer holding on unto him. Now this is me and you. Joseph was called in the court of Pharaoh to come and explain the story of cows. And he explained, you see how simple the explanation is. It simply means there will be seven years of abundant food. And from then there will be seven years of drought. Now king, it means we in this seven years of abundance, we need to save up for the seven years of drought. See how simple that was. Just because of that, just because of that. I want you to see something. When God picks you up and he has a plan about you, when he has made you unique, there's also an excellent spirit above you. The spirit of discernment. We are Christians who are walking around without the spirit of discernment. We are Christians who are walking around without an excellent spirit above us. That's why we are no longer unique. That's why we are no longer, that's why we are ineffective. Why? Because when we let go of the promise of God, even the excellent spirit departs from us. There was nothing much for Joseph to say or to do for him to finally be a governor of Egypt. It was just to say seven years of abundance, seven years of drought. Win the seven years of abundance, save for the drought. That was, it was that simple. Just like that, he became the governor from the prison to the palace. From the gutters to the house of grace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But all this is happening because Joseph held on to the dream the Lord gave him. No matter how long it takes, but it will surely come to pass. That's what he knew. That's what he believed. He knew he was different and he sticked to his different. He stick to his uniqueness. He never wanted to be like any other of his brother or any other Christian or Israelite. Verse 42 says, when, 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 they, when now drought was in Israel, Jacob the father sent the same 11 brothers to Joseph. The same 11 brothers. The same brothers who sold him to the men who were passing. He sent them. Now there's food in Egypt. We don't have food here. Go and buy food so that we can all live. And now his brothers, this is the trick, they didn't even recognize their own father. They didn't even know. The same young boy they sold many years ago is the same young man who is saving them today. Now the question is, if Joseph had let go of what God said, was he going to be able to save Israel? If you let go of what God has given you, are you going to be able to save the generations that God has laid before you? The answer is no. Why? Because you have let go of the promise. 
And you have to understand that every promise is unique. Hence, the journey becomes unique. Your journey cannot be the same as the journey of your neighbor. Why? Because your destiny is not the same. I refuse to believe that all of us, we were born in this world just merely to extend the lineage of our families. I believe we were all born because there's a purpose that God has about each and every one of us. And when we were born and reconciled to the Father, that purpose was reconnected back to us. As child of God today, I want us to pray that God reignite the spirit of excellence above us so that we don't miss the destiny you have set for us. Hallelujah. Let's read the book of Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6. Verse 3 to 5. We will jump other verses. I am reading Daniel 6, verse 3 to 5. It reads, Then this Daniel, because of an extraordinary spirit within him, began distinguishing himself among the commoners and the satraps. And the king planned to appoint him over the entire realm. Then the other two commissioners and the satraps began trying to find a reason to bring a complaint against Daniel concerning the administration of the kingdom. But they could not find no reason for an accusation or evidence of corruption because he was faithful, a man of high moral character and personal integrity and no intelligence or corruptions of any kind was found in him. Then this man said, we will not find any basis for an accusation against this Daniel unless we find something against him in connection with the law of his God. We cannot find anything wrong with him except except something that has to do with the law of his God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is Daniel. The Bible says he was a young man who had an excellent spirit because of Daniel knew who he was and what he was carrying and what God placed in his heart. The Bible says he distinguished himself. He separated himself. He never wanted to mingle himself with commoners. I'm not saying don't live with people that live with you. I'm not saying don't greet anyone because you are a child of God. But he never had his integrity compromised. He never believed that since he is in a foreign land, he has to live like foreigners. He never thought for a moment, since I am in a foreign land, it means I have to let go of everything I have learned from Israel. The Bible says by then Israel was in ruins. There was nothing left of it. But Daniel placed it in his heart that he is going to sit three times a day and face Jerusalem and pray for it. Why? There was an excellent spirit upon him. There was something special about him. Hence, the king was interested in him. Why? The, the, the constitution of Israel, he never let go of it. Yes, there was nothing hopeful about Israel. Remember, these people were slaves when they were carried to Babylon. These people were slaves. But he never got into a foreign land and say, I'm doing what people of this land are doing. He stuck to the God he knew. He never said, because I'm in a foreign land, I'm looking for a new God to serve. He stayed and stuck with the God he knew. Like he would do all the time. He kept on praying for Jerusalem. 
Now, because there was something special about him, the Bible says the satraps and the commissioner now began to be jealous of him and said, what can we do to get rid of this young man? These commissioners knew there's nothing, there's nothing wrong this young man is doing. There's no fault in everything he's doing. This man is doing his job diligently the way he's supposed to. And there is no fault whatsoever. And we can't trap him. They knew except through his God. The Bible says they went to the king and established the law. That let nobody be found worshipping another god except the gods of their land. And they convinced the king to seal the law by the senate ring. In other words, once the step of the ring was placed on the law, there is nothing that no one can do about it to change it. It's done, it's sealed. And it, the punishment for this law, new law, was death. I believe Daniel, as one of the commissioners, knew that if you worship a foreign god except the god of the land, you are supposed to die. But he carried on praying for Jerusalem. This young man knew that what he was doing would lead him to the grave, but he carried on praying. Why? Because he knew that the God he's praying to is capable enough to save him from any mess. How many of us are compromising our Christian standard because where we are, we find ourselves in situations that are life threatening. How many of us have sold our souls sold the gift of God in us. Why? Because we are in a situation that is life threatening. Some of us as young men and young women, we have sold the promise that God has given us just because there is hunger at home. Some of us, we have sold our souls to the devil just because I'm not getting enough popularity. Some of us has let go of the promises of God just because you want a sense of belonging. We are now doing things we're not even supposed to be doing in the first place. We're now saying things we're not supposed to be saying in the first place. We're now saying things like, no, mudimutu shabaki tushang. Umutu shakai karikena mupi aiti. How do you tend to help the creator when you are a creator? When something has manufactured you, you as the, some, as the product of the machine, you want to help the machine. Daniel knew that if I to be found praying again, I am a dead man. But the Bible says he carried on praying. Because these commissioners, they failed to realize that there is something unique about this young man. The king just doesn't like, there's something different about him. And he knew I am different from every other. That's why he never wanted to mingle with commoners. That's why he never wanted to do the kind of things they do. The Bible says, if you read a few chapters back, he says even their food, he was not eating it. All he ate was vegetables and drank water. And the Bible says he was even more pleasant looking at than others who were dining and whining with the king. He never forgot what God promised. He never forget, forgot where he was coming from. He never let go of the promise. He knew that Jerusalem is a chosen nation. These are God's people. These are people who have a covenant with God. 
These are the same people who said to them, to the children of Israel before they crossed the Red Sea, that the Egyptians you are seeing now, you will not see them anymore. This is the same people that God said, I will make you a peculiar nation. You are my beloved Israel. Daniel didn't forget that because he was now in the king's palace. Daniel didn't forget that because now he got a promotion. Daniel didn't forget that because now he is ruling amongst others. Daniel held on to his God. And the Bible says, those commissioners came and found him praying and went to the king. You see, when the devil fails to realize that you are still holding on to what God has given you, he makes the mistake of going back to accuse you. And the Bible says that the blood of Jesus pleads louder or better than the blood of the lamb, of the goat, of the sheep. Allow the enemy to go and accuse you. Why? Because there's the blood of Jesus who will plead better for you. All you have to do is to keep holding on to this Jesus that you received one day and you believe that he died on the cross for you and that you believe that he has good, good plans to prosper you. You just have to keep holding on to him. Allow the accuser to accuse you. And allow and give chance to the blood of Jesus to speak for you. Because it speaks better. When they went to the king, they said, remember, you said, and you agreed and signed, that whoever is found must be killed. And the Bible says, he was taken, Daniel, and threw into the lion's den. He was thrown into the lion's den. To my surprise, and to everybody's surprise, the Bible says not even one hair was found missing on him. Yet he was in the lion's den the whole night. It means Daniel believed when they were taking him and threw him in the lion's den. He might have told himself that as long as I was serving my God, it is okay. How many of us can actually say that in the face of temptation? As long as I have my Jesus, it is okay. They threw him there and they sealed with a stone. The Bible said when the king went back, when now the commissioners were gone, the king couldn't sleep. Why? Remember, there was no fault that Daniel did. The only crime he did was to hold on to his God, the God of Isaac, the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, the God of grace, the God of mercy. That was his only crime. He held on to him. The Bible says in verse 18, the next day, the king went to the den. Verse 18 says, he started calling from a distance before he could even get to the lion's den. Daniel, Daniel, has your God saved you from the lions? Hallelujah. Let's read verse 18 together. Of the same chapter 6. Are you there? It says, verse 18, Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no music or entertainment was brought before him, and he remained unable to sleep. Then the king ro arose at dawn, at the break of day, and hurried to the den of lions. When he had come near the den, he called out to Daniel with a troubled voice, the king said to Daniel, Oh, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you constantly serve, been able to rescue you from the lions? 
21, then Daniel spoke to the king, O oh, king, live forever. My God has sent his angels and, and has shut the mouth of the lions so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him and also before you, O oh, king. I have committed no crime. The king then gave a command and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and thrown into the den of lions. They, their children and their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Then Darius the king wrote to all the people, nation and speakers of every language who were living in all the land, may peace abound to you. I issue a decree that in all the dominion of the kingdom, men are to reverently fear and tremble before the God of Daniel, for he is a living God, enduring and steadfast forever. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed, and his dominion will be forever. He rescues and saves and performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So this man Daniel prospered and enjoyed success in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Sirius the Persian. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you now realize by from verse 25, that when God gives you a promise, it's so that everyone else could know that he is God. Hear what the king says, let it be known that the God of Daniel is to be reverently feared in all the universe. Why? Because his steadfastness is forever. And his kingdom is everlasting. Why? Because this God of Daniel is a different kind of God. This God of Daniel is a faithful God. This God of Daniel could not allow Daniel to be eaten by lions. Why? Because his name had to be reverenced. Now, if Daniel had given up on praying for Jerusalem, the whole of Persia would have never knew that there is a God who saves. You and I wouldn't be preaching the gospel if Daniel had stopped praying. It's because when God gives you a promise, there is a fulfilling end that he has placed for you. Can we start being the kind of Christians like the Christians of the Bible where the, our Christianity is all about God and his kingdom and never about the things that we have surrounded ourselves with? Because some of us, we have now surrounded ourselves with things that we think will take us to heaven. Whereas they are taking us to hell. Some of us, when God places us in, in situations and in positions, we forget that the, minded, the mandate of God is so that he can be known and be glorified above all else. Can we stop forgetting where God picked us from and where God saved us from? And the promises that God gave us from the beginning. And we hold on to the salvation of our souls. We speak like Daniel in Psalm 51. That take not away that Holy Spirit from me. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Why? Because it is your salvation that I am holding on to for my dear life. If only as child of, of, of children of God, we can realize that it is all about him. And the life that he has given us. 
Not about the blessings. Yes, they do follow us. Not about our heart's desires. Yes, he does grant them to us, but it is all about him. That he may be known. That we may manifest his purpose in the living, with the people that are living around us. Can we stop as children of God to surround ourselves with things that suggest heaven, whereas they are not heaven? Daniel, the Bible says, he never wanted to mingle with commoners. But we as children of God are found in places of commoners. There was a special spirit upon, upon him. He knew that and he separated himself. We are children of God that we no longer separate ourselves. We are now found everywhere. Everywhere, even in places that we are not supposed to be, we have found them. Why? Because I don't want him or I don't want them to see me as a person. It's not all about style sabupilo. It's all about him and his kingdom. Can we normalize being holy Christians who are holding on to our salvation? Not holding on to the things of this world. Can we become children of God who hold on to God so much that even when we are faced with death in our faces, we say, as long as I have the Lord on my side, even if death could come, I still hold on to my salvation. Can we be the kind of Christian that Job was, that he held on to his integrity even when he had lost everything that defined him as a man? How many of us can be put in the shoes of Job and we lose everything and we are still found holding on to our integrity? How many of us? Most of us, if we are put in Job's shoes and we lose everything, we also let go of God. Because you will st we start saying things like, where was God when I was losing everything? Why can't you be like Job and said, is the Lord who gives, is the Lord who taketh. Naked I came into this world, naked I would depart from this world. Because you understand that it's him alone that gives you life. Whatever that has to do with you comes from him. Why? Because I'm holding on to him. Can we be those Christians that says, as long as I have Jesus, as long as I have Jesus, as long as I have the Lord, my Savior, my Redeemer, as long as it looks like it's not, even though it looks like it's not going the way it's supposed to go, as long as I have him. Do you understand? That's why David said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he understood that even though I am walking right in the midst of death, as long as I have him, I am all right. I will come to the other end. You have to understand when God gives you a promise, he shows you the end of the promise. He doesn't show you the journey. You know why? Because you will never embark on that journey. If God can, had shown, if God had shown Joseph that before you become the governor of Egypt, the, your brothers are going to sell you, your, your, your master's wife is going to try to sleep with you, you'll be in prison. Do you think Joseph would have still said, this is the dream God gave me? No. God is showing you the end because he wants you to keep holding to the end. Why? Because he knows whatever will happen between now and the end, he's going to deliver you out of it all. Why? Because he's going to take every step with you. That's why the Bible says the footsteps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. Why? Because when I go through the journey, he's right there. 
All I have to do is just to hold on to him. Hold on to his promise. Never let go no matter what. Why? Because there will be people and there will be things that will suggest letting go at some point. But because I know that he who has promised me is faithful, I will hold on. I heard somebody say, we don't trust God because the situation is convincing enough. But we trust him because he who has promised is faithful enough to bring it to completion. As tembe ngomba gu, guya tembe ega. Stemba noma gunga tembe isi. Ritsepa liya usa tepa hali. Disa wanchuri disa makati layona. You still hold on to the salvation of the Lord. You don't hold on to him because he's blessing you. You hold on even though everything about you is wrong. You hold on to him even though, even when you are at your lowest point in life. You hold on. Even when there's nothing good to be said about you, you hold on. You see, when you get to the point where people even forget your name and they meet you and they say, by the way, your name is, you still hold on. Because there'll be times in your life as a child of God that the enemy is going to use the, the name of God to mock you. That when you say your name and your surname and they say, oh, is that one, oh, you still hold on. Why? Because you understand that even when they define you and explain you their own way in their best capability and in their reasoning, what they are saying about you is not what he's saying about him, about you. What he says about you is far more important than what the surrounding is saying about you. What he has for you is far more important than what you have for, your, for yourself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's why in Ephesians he said, I am able to do exceedingly abundantly above what you think about yourself. You think a child of God. I am able to do far beyond what you are thinking. Why? Because I know the end that I have for you. I know what I have planned for you. All God wants us to do is to hold on to him. And to trust him. And keep the faith holding on to him. Understanding that as long as I am holding on to him, nothing would go wrong. And understanding that even if there are things that are going wrong, they are all working for my good. That's why he said in Isaiah, do not fret, do not despair. Do not be afraid. I am your God. Do not be afraid. I am your God. Let us read the last scripture in Hebrews. Hebrews 10.39. Are you there? Hebrews 10, 39, it says, but our way is not that of those who shrink back to destruction, but we are of those who believe, meaning relying on God through faith in Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and by his confident faith, persevere, preserves our soul. But our way is not that of those who shrink back to destruction, in your way, when there are things that are a thorn in your flesh, you don't shrink back to where you go, you're coming from. But we are of those who believe. And it says, meaning relying on God through faith in Jesus Christ. When you are holding on, you are relying on him. 
through faith. You are not doing what, what you are thinking. You are relying. You are waiting on him. Your, his word is your command. You can't move without him saying so. You can't stop without him saying so. Why? Because you are relying on him. Through faith in Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And by this confident faith, preserve your soul. Meaning when you are holding on, you are preserving. When you keep holding and relying on him, he preserves you. That's why he said in, in, in Psalms that with long life, I will satisfy you. Why? Because you are holding on. And his promise is when you hold on, he preserves you. Then he satisfies your soul. Remember Psalms 1 says those who wait on the Lord are like the trees that are planted by the banks of the waters. Who bear their fruit in right season. Whose leaf they never wither or die. Why? Because they are at the bank of the river. There is always water there. There is never a dry season there. But you can only be that tree when you are holding and relying on. Can we come out of the agenda of people as children of God about what people think God is or what God should be in us? And we hold on to the promise, which is his word. And we experience God for ourselves, not what other people think he's supposed to be. You hold on to the word and you hold it even when situations suggest the other way. Can we be the kind of Christian who live by the word, not by the statistics of our country or our world? Who live by the word of God? Ask your neighbor and say, are you still holding on? Are you still holding on?